Good day and welcome to the investor call of Orion Pro Solutions Limited to discuss the Q2 and H1 FY25 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participants' lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Ashvisha from Ad Factors PR, Investor Relations. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Neha. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the company, I would like to welcome you all to the earnings conference call for Q2 and H1 FI25. Today, on this call, we have with us from the management, Mr. Ashish Rai, Vice Chairman and Group CEO, Mr. Vipul Parmar, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. Ninad Kelkar, Company Secretary. We will begin the call with brief opening remarks from the management, followed by a Q&A session. Please note that certain statements made during this call may be forward-looking in nature. Such forward-looking statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results or projections to differ materially from those statements. Orient Pro Solutions will not be in any way responsible for any actions taken based on such statements and undertakes no obligation to publicly update these forward-looking statements. I would now like to hand over the call to Mr. Ashish Shai for his opening remarks. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thanks, Ashwi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this earnings call for Q2 FY25. I'm sure by now you've all received the investor deck, and, and I hope you had an opportunity to review it. Um, I'm very pleased, pleased to share the continuing strong performance in Q2 and, and in H1. We continue to make significant progress in the quarter on our agenda to expand the banking software business to newer markets, as well as to recalibrate parts of the TIG business to focus on better economics, as we've talked about before. Our revenue for Q2 has grown by 32% um, on the back of continued momentum across um, the businesses, especially on the banking side. Uh, EBITDA increased by 23% and PAT grew by 34%, which is a great indicator of continued effective execution by the team. Building a scaled-up enterprise technology player that delivers value on the global stage uh, will take immense focus <clears throat> on a complex range of factors, and it's worth appreciating how steadily and methodically the team has continued to make progress across the various aspects of the strategic agenda. Uh, to recap the performance, revenue for the quarter stood at 278 crore rupees, which is a significant increase on the YOY basis. Uh, PAT stood at 46 crores for Q2, and PAT margins for the quarter stood at 16.4%, which is uh, slightly above the guided range of 15 to 16. Uh, EBITDA margin for the quarter stood at 20.3%, well within the guided range, but down a point from the previous quarter due to a one-off FX loss that we had. Um, this growth is driven by significant expansion in demand for our core offerings as well as our entry into newer markets where we are increasingly succeeding because of the competitiveness of our product stack. The most important highlight of the first half of the year has been the significant progress our teams have made on product build-outs as well as new market entries for both banking as well as TIG. Uh, this progress doesn't show up in the quarterly results, but it's probably the most significant determinant of our ability to achieve Orion Pro's stated vision 2030 and deliver industry-leading returns on capital for our shareholders. We announced market expansion and deal wins across Americas, across Southeast Asia, across Middle East and Africa, and we feel confident that we will continue to see an acceleration of these based on the strong growth in pipeline and our ability to convert pipeline into deal wins across both the segments. Banking and fintech business continues to experience a very strong demand environment and our win rates have been very good thanks to the competitiveness of our product stack as well as the increasing effectiveness of our sales and delivery teams. We have especially made very strong progress on enabling our enterprise software in banking with the very mature ML offerings from ARIA.ai 
and that has especially enhanced both our win rates as well as the size of the revenue opportunity for our enterprise application stack. Um, the last quarter was also great from the standpoint of industry recognition with Orion Pro featuring as global category leader across five of Chartist Risk Tech quadrants as well as featuring strongly on the Global Risk Tech 100 report. Um, coming to the TIG business, uh, TIG has been focusing sharply on growth in transit payments and data center space, as well as recalibrating the business on the smart city side for better economics and cash efficiency. We've been talking about this. I think we've made tremendous progress on this and feel great about improving demand and economics on this side of the business through rest of the year. Um, TIG had a landmark win with Safe City Panvel project, as well as significant wins with strategic partners in data center business, which will set us up very well for a strong second half. Our focus for rest of the year going forward will be to stick to the strategy and do more of the same. Continue to invest strongly in R&D to support product build-outs, especially around entering new markets where we do need to build out you know, some additional bits on the product to enable them for the newer markets, as well as to AI enable the product stack, as well as focus on execution and cash efficiency in some parts of the business, where we need tighter execution to wind down some projects that have struggled due to lead time that we need to build capacity to deliver. Um, as we look towards the rest of this FY and beyond, we feel confident about our ability to continue to strongly grow the business while investing in building capabilities, and offerings that will fuel the long-term earnings power for the firm. We are heading into the second half with great momentum and feel good about delivering our guided growth of 30% plus and keep earnings margin within the guided bands. We'll continue to explore inorganic options as well that complement our existing capabilities or enhance our presence in chosen markets to positively impact our longer-term growth potential. Finally, we extend our sincere gratitude to our employees, customers, partners, and shareholders for their continued support and contribution to our success. With that, I'll close, and I look forward to an engaging Q&A. Um, over to you, Ashwin. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchdown telephone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Vimal Jamnadas Gohil from Alchemy Capital Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, congratulations on a great quarter. Hey, hey, Vimal. Um, hi, I can't hear you properly. Can you be a bit louder? Uh, is this better? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Great. Hi. So, uh, so, so my first question was around uh, on uh, on margins. Uh, uh, could you help us, or rather, could you take us through various puts and takes uh, of this 152 basis points decline quarter on quarter? And even on on a YOY basis, our margins have slipped to the lower band of our guided range. I I do understand that you you know you have given a guided range for a reason, but uh, if you can help us explain the factors that have led to this particular decline, and then I have a follow up. Okay. Yeah. So look, uh, Vimal, thanks for the question. Um, <laughs> and I think you 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 said this in your question itself. I've, I've said this. It's very. At the pace at which we are growing, it's hard to calibrate EBITDA margin down to a fine point, and that's why we give a range of 20 to 22. Um, I would say um, there are significant investments that we are making um, in terms of uh, supporting the products to expand into newer markets, and, and we are sort of, um, I think when you are building product at rapid speed, um, even if you have order book to sort of deliver, uh, there is there will be periods where um, the expense kind of goes a little bit ahead of the revenue, right? Um, and not to a significant extent because we are very measured in where we make our invest investments, but they will be, uh, that's why we keep the 2% band. It, expenses will sometimes shoot up, um, right? So I think we are um, expanding at a pace that we've never done before 
we are entering new markets at a pace we've not done before we are doing product build outs especially ai enabling the whole product stack like we've never done before so um, yes there is a significant uptick in um, in in sort of uh, both the headcount as well as the expenses that are going in but there is there is um, even if it's a little bit of lag there's revenue to back it up um, in this specific quarter we also had a 4 crore fx loss um, which is a which is a one off and and that is probably a point hit or or slightly more than a point um, hit on the EBITDA. But you know, I would really advise not to read too much into the quarterly EBITDA numbers because honestly, we cannot calibrate down to a fine point. So sometimes it will go to 23, sometimes it will come down to 20. Uh, but by and large, there is nothing fundamentally changing from one quarter to the next in terms of the business economics. Uh, right? I mean, that's what I would say to it. I, I I hope that answers the question. But I would really advise not to read too much on these numbers from one quarter to the next. Fair enough, Ashish. Thank you so much. Uh, Ashish, the second question was around uh, our balance sheet and cash flow. Uh, so what I uh, notice is that uh, while the EBITDA growth has been very strong in the first half, uh, hasn't led to uh, uh, generating uh, uh, operating cash. Uh, so we've, we've sort of reported a negative operating cash of 66 crores uh, this, this in the first half. Which is of course led by uh, the uh, receivables and other assets, and I'm, I believe this is due to the increase in unbuilt receivables. So, if you can take us, uh, how do we sort of unwind this? How how does the how does the full year of FI25 look, and how do we make sure that you know uh, uh, the, the, we return back to normalize the cash generation? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, great question, Vimal. Right. So, um, look, cash flow would be a little bit cyclical um, for us and I'll probably try and explain the factors but by and large the headline story is when we are um, growing parts of the business rapidly uh, the cash conversion will suffer as the businesses come down to lower growth rates the cash conversion will get better at a, at a I mean that's too generic a statement but I think that is at a headline level what what really happens right in terms of the actual factors that go into the negative 66 um, let me think through those. So I would say one very large factor is, um, and I have to be careful, you know, what I can sort of disclose, but we are in some M&A process, um, uh, you know, for, 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 a, for large global asset, which is kind of a, uh, a court sort of process, and, and, and there's been deposits that have been given. Um, you know, it sort of works two ways. Either you succeed, in which case um, we probably have an M&A. If you don't succeed, then the deposit gets returned back. But those sort of um, add up to to the cash that goes out, especially when it would show up on 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 other assets or something. Um, we do also have um, the unbuilt part that you're talking about. So it's not just unbuilt; it's totally unbuilt as well as receivables. But basically, we have started on very large. Uh, we've had very large wins on the banking side, right? Especially where we've had, you know, projects like State Bank of India, we've had wins in Saudi Arabia, um, we've had um, a very large global fintech vendor where we've built out uh, new products which, which they're selling. Uh, the, these are actually pretty significant successes, but what really happens as we are ramping into these projects is that, you know, um, we are making progress. We accruing revenues in some cases we will voice those out but um, bulk of the conversion will happen as we take these clients live um, in the case of these large projects most of these are within the year so and that's why i say you know you'd see some cyclicality between now and and then but by december january some of these large projects would be live um, we would collect the cash before march so i think you know that will normalize um, the, the inorganic process as well will normalize we've had some um, also um, around the ESOP schemes that we've rolled out to to attract the right kind of talent and motivate our employees. Um, we've had, uh, you know, some outflow in terms of loans to uh, advances to employees to enable them to um, on the ESOP schemes, right? So that's also a material number. Uh, so there's, a, there's quite a few of these, but I think the headline story is um, there will be some level of cyclicality in terms of cash flow conversion when we are going at rapid pace especially parts of the businesses which are growing at rapid pace. So banking now is growing at 50% plus. So we will start large projects and the larger the project, um, the more the sort of uh, mismatch that's likely to happen. 
uh, we had the same problem when TIG was growing rapidly the last couple of years at 50% plus. So we slowed TIG down this year to focus more on cash efficiency and that will start showing up in the second half of the year. So I fully expect by the time we get to March, you know, a lot of these conversions would have happened and, and you'll see the result. But again, you know, when we look at balance sheet from one quarter to the next, um, you will see some of these variances going out. I, I hope that answers the question, but I'm happy to take a follow up on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if I may, uh, Ashish. So, uh, what you're saying is, by uh, by the end of FY25, we should be returning to positive OCF. Yes. And uh, assuming, I'm just, I'm just not, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but assuming that the growth rate continues to be strong in FY26, we should not see this kind of uh, uh, cyclicality or rather uh, uh, lumpiness in 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 cash flows because TIG would clearly be growing lesser as compared to your banking business. Correct me if I'm wrong here. True. Yeah, yeah. No, so you're right. So, and that is the reason. And then we've been very, look, I've been totally transparent on this, why we've slowed down parts of the business, why we are accelerating other parts of the business. Uh, banking, I mean, other than the, the few large projects we've started off, tends to generally be fairly cash efficient. And you, we typically finish off most projects within 12 months. So, so you would normally be very, very uh, reasonably efficient. So yes, by the time you finish FY25, I think it would be, um, it would be a different picture, but the second thing is also the mix of the businesses. You know, we continue to focus on it. Like, I think what we need to really understand as managers, maybe even as, as Olympio shareholders is, um, I think um, businesses which go through rapid growth would not have the same predictability of cash efficiency as a mature business going at 5% or 7% would, right? And and in the product business, it sort of becomes a bit more susceptible to um, uh, the, the, the timeline of the project going live. But having said that, I am very confident as we go from one financial year to the next, we will get much stronger and stronger as we go because um, the bottom line is, um, Banking software is, is fundamentally a business with very good economics and it's growing at 50%, right? So I think some of the cyclicality aside, um, I think by the time we finish the year, a lot of these projects will be live. By the time we get into FY26, we'll be much stronger on the balance sheet than FY25, right? So I think we'll keep going from there. Great, great. So last statement, uh, I'll, I'll take that as uh, the crux of it. All right. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All the very best. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Karthik Ayer, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, am I audible? Hi, Karthik. Yes. Uh, hi, Ashish. Congrats on a good set. Um, I just had a couple of questions regarding TIG. Congrats on the uh, Panvel order win. I just wanted to know what is the timeline for execution of that project and what would be, could if you could throw some light on the margins we would be making on that? Okay, yeah. Hi, Karthik. So, look, T TIG, um, and as I've said, we uh, maybe give a little bit of background on this. Um, on the smart city side, we deliberately slowed down the business over the last year uh, to focus on um, identifying the, the levers to getting better economics on that side. We obviously built up some fantastic IP. We built up some fantastic capabilities on that side, but we wanted to be very careful as we get that business back to growth. Uh, Safe City Panvel, um, we've carefully selected as a business with the right sort of parameters. We, would, we bring enough value to the table for us, for us to get the economics right. Right. So um, that is, um, again, having said that, we are still calibrating that side of the business, but that is what our, our plan is and hence the project. We will get most of the delivery done between 16 to 18 months. I think um, beyond the 12 months, I think we'll get most of the delivery is done. It is a multi-year project, but um, I would say uh, on the outside at about 18 months, we'll get most of the deliveries done. Um, and if you could throw any light on the margins for that? Oh, yeah. So margins uh, are kind of on, on this. Uh, so I, I don't think we can specifically highlight the deal margins, but it's high double digits. Okay. And um, if you could throw some light on, you know, is there any fresh order wins with regard to transit and uh, anything that we are, you know, the order book for the data center space? Okay. So, um, look, transit side, we have had uh, significant traction in Americas. 
Uh, we've announced large wins in Mexico, which we're delivering against. We've had success in Costa Rica, Ecuador, etc. We continue to double down on those. Uh, we are also now seeing some um, new progress in terms of closed loop to open loop movement in the U.S. Um, we are involved in a bunch of POCs, which we hope will translate into large scale sort of um, or action on part of the government participants and the transit operators. So we hope to see for the next few quarters a lot more action in the U.S. market itself. Of course, California continues. You know, we are live in more and more cities, and and that progresses. But we we feel um, the market is ready for more um, action in other states, states other than California, and and there's a bunch of POCs going out. Uh, we are also now on the transit side, um, uh, sort of seriously getting into Europe both um, largely in terms of our partnerships with, with other um, larger players, so more as part of consortia than going directly ourselves, but there is a lot more traction there. Um, and we are now, we have some very strong, well-progressed pipeline opportunities in Asia, in, in, in um, let's say, Southeast Asia in a few countries, right? So again, those should come to fruition over the next couple of quarters. So Transit has very strong traction outside of India. In India, we... We've had success with, with one of the metro projects, but we are being very uh, measured in, in, in the kind of transit business we take on in India. I think globally the expansion would be a lot stronger. Um, the question around the data center space, we have had um, sort of significant order wins from Iron Mountain and WebWorks, which we've, um, I think we've uh, sort of publicly disclosed. Uh, that business continues to grow. Um, we continue to work on some on the R and D side in that business to um, to hopefully be able to get some productized offerings out. But this is a it's it, it's a long haul. It's it, it's complex to to really get the productization right in that space. But we are working through it. Um, I think the order wins are are there. So so this year data center business will should should grow at a very very um, at, at, at a very good number. But then um, it's been growing at that rate for the last few years. So it will continue to expand. Right, so I think it's 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 back. it's still a larger share on the TIG order book. Also, thanks to some of the newer orders we picked up on both the data center space as well as uh, Safe City Panvel and all. Right, um, so that is where we are. Banking continues to pick up um, a higher volume of um, smaller ticket size orders and continues to sort of execute on those. Thank you. And uh, across both the businesses, uh, could you share like a rough margin range? I know the blended one target guidance that we've got is for 22% around that range, but what would it be uh, for individual segments? Roughly? Yeah, so look, I, I, there's a reason, Anand, I, I don't really, uh, we don't get into segment-wise margins because, you know, I think the thing is, one, um, uh, the, the, the smaller you make the scale, the lesser you get the price stability in terms of margins, right? Having, and that's why we, we keep it at a, at a macro level, but having said that, I would say banking is anywhere between four to six points above the enterprise margin, and TID at the moment is probably four points, five points below the enterprise margin. But then it really varies by uh, the segment inside these segments, subsegment inside these segments, as well as the nature of work that you're talking about, right? So it, it, you know, the smaller you get, the less predictable your margin is. In some quarters, it would be exceptional. In some quarters, it will come down. So then that's the reason we don't really narrow it down. Hopefully by next year, each of the segments is scaled up enough for us to start publishing it. Um, but at the moment, I would say just as a general thumb rule, say four to six points above on the banking and fintech side and four, four to five points below on the, the ID side. 
Perfect. Thank you so much and all the best for the following year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Karthik Iyer, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, I seem to have got cut off. Uh, so, so one follow up on the banking. Um, on are we investing in you know a team to execute all the successful order wins that we are doing in the banking and fintech space? Yeah, Karthik. So I I hope you got the um, my answer to the last question, right? So on the on the banking team side, um, look. Um, I would say the number one focus for Orion Pro at the moment, uh, as well as the number one challenge in front of us, is is scaling up delivery capacity. Right? I think it all looks nice that we are growing at 50%, but um, it is um, it is complex. You need the full spectrum of skill sets. So unlike a, a, a typical services shop where you know someone else defines what needs to be built and then we're looking up for a bunch of developers, we need a much more complex spectrum. You know, the full spectrum of skill sets to to mobilize product teams. Um, and the sec- and, and it's not so straightforward. The second is um, most of the capacity addition that we need to do on the banking side is people who implement our own applications. So you need to really train people up on the applications that we build, and that also takes time. Um, so I would say um, the lead time to really build capacity out is proving to be a little bit longer than that than we than you know we should have, and. That also sort of results in uh, weakness in terms of cash conversion because you know it sort of it, it comes down right. You need to have the capacity to take the clients live. You need to take the clients live to convert the orders into cash, and and the whole thing adds up, right? So I think we are working heavily on this. This is the number one focus item for us. We have um, instituted a new learning and development function inside Audient Pro uh, to really step up how quickly we ramp up resources, we we built out internal training mechanisms because we can't find um, enough experienced talent out in the market. Um, we are hiring heavily from um, the global peer group in centers outside of India to be able to get the right sort of skill sets, right? So, and that's the reason why we run R&D centers in Singapore, R&D centers in Istanbul, in Vietnam, uh, right? So, we are broad-basing the talent base. We are instituting um, heavy investments in, in sort of internal training mechanisms to ramp up the the teams. We have obviously added people, so you can see that the, the headcount is 2,500 plus. But I think we are not a very resource intensive business. Uh, you need the right quality of skill sets, right? So I think that is where the challenge is. That is where we are super focused on it. We have also built up the management bench. You know, we've been, I think from time to time, we've sort of introduced. Uh, people, um, uh, the, the senior managers who, who joined in, so we, we've hired the right set. I feel we have probably one of the most talented management teams um, in the industry today in terms of product build-outs, um, and then we've added capacity to the lower levels in the question of sort of training them and ramping it up, right? Um, I think it's a continuous process, um, and it's not that um, it's not happening fast, but um, I would be a lot happier if it happened a little bit faster than, than we are, and we'll keep sort of working at it. I mean, it's just the right question to ask, but, um, I, you know, I, I would say we, we need to keep working at it. Uh, no, that's extremely helpful, sir. Thank you so much for the insight. All the best moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik. And on that point, sorry to just um, add the answer. We will, um, we will probably try to deploy some, um, you know, um, let's say, not so organic approaches as well, where we get an opportunity to quickly scale up talent, right? So, for example, um, on the AI side, we were struggling for quite some time, but uh, acquiring Arya.ai has really um, lent us a lot of strength in terms of talent coming in. Same thing on the lending side, when we acquired OmniFrame, we were, um, you know, we, re- we really grew up the talent on the lending side. So, we'll always be open, um, you know, for. Um, opportunities where, you know, the inorganic opportunities that allow us to quickly ramp up on talent, uh, as well as obviously come with products and revenues which are relevant to us. But, you know, even just from a talent standpoint, some level of acquire sort of opportunities, um, you know, I think they do show themselves up and we'll probably act on those in ways that make sense. Thank you. Thank you. The 
The next question is from the line of Anmol Garg from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Ashish. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. A uh, couple of things. Um, firstly, we have shown very strong growth on the banking side uh, of things. Uh, uh, now, uh, can you can you indicate uh, uh, some of the areas where we are seeing this growth, uh, particularly on the product side? Which of the products are showing more traction uh, versus the others? Hey, and more hi. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so banking. Um, I think the probably two or three levers which 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 are working for us at the moment. Uh, one, uh, the strongest area of growth is transaction banking at the moment. Uh, so we, which is where we announced um, deal wins in Saudi Arabia. I mean, given the state of the pipeline and how well progressed the pipeline is, I'm very sure we'll announce more wins uh, in that space going forward. So that segment, um, and this is where again we won SBI, Canada Bank, etc. Last year, wrote. so this is a segment which is growing rapidly, where our win rates are, I would say, probably the best in the industry right now and the pipeline is very large, right? So when you combine a very large pipeline with, um, uh, you know, us being the player with probably the strongest win rates in the business that, you know, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I think I'm very confident that translates into a, a very large number of wins even in the future. Uh, but that's where, you know, the growth is uh, very strong. The second area where we see very strong growth on the banking side is where we have uh, sort of AI enabled the product stack so even the transaction banking side, part of the win rates being better than the competitors today is how AI enabled our product stack is, right? So for example, on the transaction banking side, we have implemented a number of use cases. Even in uh, uh, the wins we did in the past, like State Bank of India, these the Middle East wins and all, um, they go together with a, a lot of um, actual AI decisioning going into the product stack, right? And I think that both improves our win rate there, but wherever we AI enable the stack, we see just... Um, I mean, it's just, we've never seen this level of demand before, right, on, on, on that side. It's just unprecedented, the, the scale of demand on the enterprise AI offering. So that's number two. Uh, and the third area where we've seen, let's say, over the first half, pretty rapid growth is the, um, so uh, the, the FinTech ecosystem uh, sort of partnerships that we built out with some of the global players. I think that has been, uh, a lot of those have gone from zero to very material numbers, even in the six months, and for the full year, they'll be, uh, very, very material numbers, right? So these fintech partnerships, especially in the U.S., um, probably in the second half in Europe, um, will get some wins. You know, those are working very, very well for us, right? So I think those are the three major areas. Um, lending also, we've, we've won um, a few deals that we announced, and it's growing uh, as well. Uh, but those first three uh, levers are, like, uh, expanding very strongly. Understood, understood. Um, uh, yes, uh, thanks for this. Uh, and uh, I think uh, during your uh, media interview, you indicated that uh, our U.S. growth will be very strong in FI25, probably in the range of 60-70%. Um, can, can you again indicate that uh, uh, would this be coming from the deals that we have already won? Or uh, is there uh, a good pipeline over there from where this growth can come from? So I would say um, for the second half of the year, um, there may be one or two that convert from the pipeline, but most of the growth would come from deals we've already won, um, right? Um, I think a lot of this expansion is around the uh, the third lever that I mentioned, which is the fintech partnerships that we've struck, um, right? So um, some of the revenue, honestly, you know, because a lot of the IP that we provide is Singapore-based, so I, I need to see where um, sort of the revenue falls, um, right? But it's essentially... Um, the, the end U.S. clients, mostly through the fintech partnerships, I think we see a strong growth. Uh, bulk of it will come from orders we already won. Uh, there are deals in the pipeline, uh, but, you know, just the revenue contribution for those would probably be next year. Understood, understood. And lastly, uh, just wanted to dwell a little bit more on our cash flows, uh, which have been a bit uh, negative during the quarter. So, uh, in... In here, uh, wanted to understand that uh, we have also signed a deal in the TIG space, uh, which is the Safe City project for Panvel. Uh, now, uh, how is the receivables for this particular project versus the company average? And do you believe that uh, by the end of the year, uh, our receivables can 
particularly as we execute through through the team, the receivables can be impacted a bit more uh, by executing this team. Yeah. So uh, okay, um, I'll probably split that up, right? I think the, the Panvel project specifically, we very carefully uh, worked on it in terms of the payment milestones, in terms of you know what the execution milestones are. So we feel good that. Uh, it is not going to impose any additional pressure um, going in uh, other than, you know, normal. Um, there is a few uh, TIG projects that I've talked about in the past where we know we've had pressure. We've had a very special team focused on um, sort of executing against these projects and getting these done um, in time before end of the year, right? So I think um, I feel that um, on that side, by the time we get into February, March, um, the execution situation would be would be uh, very different, and 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 a lot of the cash collection priorities that we set in place would already be done. Um, I think Panvel specifically, we feel good that we've uh, because you know as as you know we had slowed down that side of the business uh, to really only be able to take business that we feel comfortable with. I think um, this is a project we very carefully identified, so I don't feel um, this would really be. Um, I think this would be pretty much a normal um, project in terms of both the execution milestones as well as collections. Um, uh, so overall, that should get better, right? I think on the on the cash flow side, a lot of the pressure is coming in. Uh, what really happens is um, whatever part of the business is growing the fastest um, sort of creates that issue because um, in, the, in the product business, a lot of the cash happens when you take the client's life. And if you're starting off a lot more projects than you're finishing off, it is just natural for... Uh, you know, sort of the cash collection to to, to come under pressure. Plus, we've had um, you know the topics I talked. I, I think you were earlier in the call. Um, so, topics that I talked about earlier, which is around some inorganic opportunities, which is a one-off opportunities, which we feel we needed to needed to play. Um, right. So, we'll see what the results of those are. Understood. Understood. Um, yeah, uh, I I think that's it from my end. Thank you so much, Ashish, for answering the question. Thank you, Amos. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Pranay Roop Chatterjee from Berman Capital Management. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, Pranay. Hi. Great. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, this is the first time I'm attending this call and I'm new to the company, so I have a slightly fundamental question. Uh, so I was looking at your uh, revenue mix and 70% is from software services and around 30% is from uh, sale of equipment and product licenses. So given this information, I wanted to understand what is the recurring portion in your total revenue? Like for example, if you're earning 100 crores in a quarter, uh, what proportion is from one-time sales, be it software or product? And is there like a maintenance component or a recurring component which allows you to continue earning revenue over a certain period of time? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Ryan. So, look, I think the way to read the software services and product licensing um, difference is largely one-off versus um, what is either uh, recurring, near recurring, or implementation services, um, right? Uh, but a bunch of recurring revenue would also come into the product licenses mix because we increasingly do a lot more subscriptions. Uh, right, so I think it's it's uh, it's hard to read a exact recurring number in those numbers. Uh, let me um, sort of um, let me try and answer it this way. Uh, split the business into two parts. You got banking software, which does 55%. You got TIG, which does 45%. On the banking software side, I would say our recurring plus near recurring revenue is something of the order of 55 to 60%. Um, when the business was growing slower, when the business was growing at 15%, that used to be closer to 65 to 70%, right? But now the business is going a last, lot faster, so there's a lot more uh, kind of one-off implementation projects, etc. So recurring plus near recurring. So recurring is typically AMCs uh, or, and uh, subscriptions, and the near recurring is essentially like ongoing services with long-time existing customers like UOB, OCBC, etc. Right? So, so those would be 55 to 60, and the other 40 will come from a mix of one-off licenses plus one-off implementation projects, which typically are 12 to 18 month projects that we do when we take on new logos. So that is the 55% um, uh, banking business. Uh, coming to the TIG side, 
PID side, I would say the recurring mix is lesser. It's probably of the order of 25 to 30 percent. And um, that typically comes from the long duration projects we sign in terms of transit revenue streams. When we sell um, software and equipment outside of India, like deals like California, Maldives, et cetera, these tend to almost be like software contracts because you charge something upfront, you charge an AMC, you charge an operations fee. So those again become recurring streams with some one, one of their rights. I would say they're uh, probably 30%. If you added near recurring deals, which are long-term services contracts around, let's say, uh, so cloud, for example, most of the cloud that we sell on the TIG site is around our own products, and these are long-term multi-duration contracts. So that probably climbs up another 10, 15% in, in those sort of deals. Um, so that's the way I will look at it. Um, does, that, does that answer the question clearly enough? That, that's excellent, sir, and gives me a lot of uh, color on the business. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, my second and last question, sir, is try to understand your revenue model, right? So. Uh, obviously, over the course of time, you have expanded into various different products and segments. But if I were to ask you, is there a predominant way you charge your clients? Like uh, either it be employee hour basis or uh, in terms of some metric of how they use your software. Like uh, how do you charge your client? Is there one answer or like would there be multiple answers? So there would be multiple answers depending on what IP that is. But typically, I would say for the banking software side, there are two models that we sell um, uh, largely, um, which should apply to like 80% of the business. We sell term licenses where you, we charge a one-off license fee and then people pay AMCs, uh, right? And the second is the subscription model where uh, both the license and the AMC would combine into one stream. So typically, let's say if you signed a $6 million five-year TCO deal, um, typically, one third of it would be license revenue. So $2 million is license revenue paid either upfront or paid over five installments over five years. The second is maintenance revenue, which is typically 20%. So that's another $2 million over five years, um, right? So 400K per year for five years. And then the third is implementation fee of $2 million is typically a project that gets done over 12 to 18 months on an average. Now, these are like broad thumb rules. Uh, there are some other models in banking which are smaller in revenue terms, especially consumption-based models where, for example, we sell an API call and you're charging per API call, um, right? Uh, but those are not, I, w I would not say that's huge from a revenue standpoint, but those models also exist within the banking world. Um, on the, uh, yes, I think that is a predominant way. We have, uh, for example, on the transit side and all, we've got very long-term 10-year, 12-year contracts where there's revenue share and, and things like that. So it depends on how you are selling IP, um, right? And sometimes there will be transaction-driven models. Um, a lot of times it will be license-driven models. Got it, sir. Thanks a lot for answering my question. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hardik Gori from Alpha Plus Capital Associates. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, what is the current mix uh, of uh, TIG between smart mobility and data center? Okay, so um, TIG, I, I would sort of put three slices to it, um, right? And I, I, so till last year, each of those were probably a third each. So you, you have smart mobility, uh, which is essentially the, um, the open loop transit payments uh, stack that we, that we sell. Um, the second is data center and hybrid cloud. Um, that is the second slice. Uh, most of it is hybrid cloud is basically around our own applications by and large, and data center is where we design and, and, and program manage the build of, of, of data centers. Um, and the third slice is smart cities, slash government technology work that we do, right? Um, I would say this year, uh, the mix is, is uh, so last year I think it was probably a third each um, out of the 45% that, that goes on the TIG side. Uh, this year, I would say um, the smart city side is probably going to be a little bit smaller. So it's more like, I would say, 35, um, 40, uh, and yeah. So uh, they're about 20, 25 on the, on the smart city side. So I think that's, that's roughly the mix. Okay, okay, okay. And what is it that we are expecting in, say, uh, in the next uh, three, four years? Look, I think it... Uh, so over three, four years, uh, I do not like 
um, giving a guidance that far out. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a reason for it, right? So I think the, the way to look at it is this. We have a stated vision 2030. Um, externally, there is a qualitative view that we published which says in each of the spaces that we are in, we want to be a top three global player. Uh, internally, we have a quantitative number against each of those. The reason that quantitative number is not very important over a three to four year horizon is, I think we will keep on um, sort of calibrating the growth as we go. Uh, typically, the business as a whole, we're saying we grow in the range of 30%. That's what we've done for the last four years. That's what we feel like we can keep on doing for a long time. But inside it, um, we will keep on changing the pace at which businesses grow because in the product business, it's fundamentally very risky to keep your foot on the pedal um, all the time. Uh, what really happens in the services business, if I want to sort of grow 100%, I double the number of people, hire the right skill set, the job is largely done, you of course need to do the projects. In the product business, if you plan grow too fast, uh, there are lots of interconnected pieces. Some pieces will break if you go too fast. Right? So we'll keep on resetting the, the, the sort of growth. So banking, for example, last two years was growing a lot slower, 15%. Uh, last year, 30%, 15% the year before, because we said we want to focus on product build-outs. We don't want to grow. Now it's growing at 51%. TIG was growing at 55% the year before, last year, 33%. Um, this year, we slowed it down even more because we say we want to focus on uh, some IP build outs, you want to focus on calibrating the business for better economics. So within, you know, so I would not put too much um, sort of um, emphasis on sub-segment level planning for the next four or five years. We will broadly, these are very large spaces. If you are a top three global player by 2030, obviously you're not growing at 30-35% because at 30-35% the business becomes maybe four times, maybe five times over, 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 over the next five, six years. Um, if you are a top three global player, you probably have to be much larger than that. So we do expect sometime between now and 2030, we will hit inflection points for various businesses where we can really step up the growth. When that time comes, we'll come and talk about it. Till that time, I would say at the enterprise level, we try and target a 30% odd range. Within that, some businesses from the time to time will grow faster and some businesses will slow down um, and we will sort of pace it that way. I, I mean, I know it's a, probably a pretty long winded answer uh, to something which should be a pretty, you know, uh, straightforward question, but um, that's the way we think about it at least. Hopefully that helps. That's helpful and that's all from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankush Agarwal from Search Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you for taking my question. So, Ashish, uh, would it be possible for you to share some more big details on the possible m and that you're alluding to? Uh, is it like an operating business that you're looking to acquire, or is it like a specific IP that you're looking to acquire, if you can share? Uh, I can't share too many details. It's an operating business yet, but um, I, I can't share. You know, it's sort of a pretty complex process. <laughs> process. You know, I, I can't even say we feel confident about doing that. I mean, I, I just mentioned that because there's a question about cash. Um, right, so we are always, um, you know, actively in a lot of processes that don't really um, pan out. So I would not kind of spend too much time on it. Got it. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take this as the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ashish Rai, Vice Chairman and Group CEO, for closing comments. Yeah, so thanks everyone for taking the time out of your busy days to come and join us on this call. Um, we, I mean, there is really no uh, significant changes to what we do. We do more of the same. Um, we focus on building the products out. We focus on R&D. We focus on expanding to new markets. We focus on our partnerships. Um, we really value you spending time to try and understand us. Um, we will, um, I look forward to seeing you again next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Orion Pro Solutions Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.